This is worksheet 5 of the equations packet. Um, on this worksheet we are going to continue working on balancing equations by um, putting coefficients in front of formulas so that the number of reactants equal the number of products. Um, but the extra addition is that you are not going to be given the so-called skeleton equation, the already set up equation. So there's going to be two steps rather than one step in these problems. The first step is to write out a skeleton equation from the word description of the equation provided. And then the second step will be to balance the equation using coefficients like you have done before. So I think you will see that this is not really adding much more complexity beyond what you've already done on worksheets 3 and 4. So we will do uh, one of each type of reaction, composition, decomposition, single replacement, and double replacement. I've made space on my um, worksheet to do these, but your worksheet does not have space. So I need you to have out a separate sheet of paper. You need to make sure to title that paper, Equations Worksheet Number 5, and you're going to write... Um, all of the equations that I am writing on your paper. You may choose to just write all of the examples that we're doing together and then go on out of numerical order when you get to class to finish the rest, or you may number your page <clears throat> 1 through 15, uh, leaving space so that you can go back and fill in the other equations once you get to class. Either way is fine. So, um, we'll look first at our example composition reaction. So it says magnesium, Mg, plus sulfur, S, yields magnesium sulfide. So remember that yields is telling you where the arrow is going to be. right? So anything before the word yields is going to be a reactant, and anything after the word yields is going to be a product. When I write this out, I am going to leave lines where I can go back and put coefficients, uh, like was done for you in worksheets 3 and 4. So, we have magnesium plus sulfur yielding, or producing would also suggest that I would use an arrow. You might see that in some of the problems. Uh, and it yields magnesium sulfide. Now, do not worry about if there should be coefficients or if there shouldn't be. These formulas have already been created for you. So to say they've already been properly swapped and dropped. So you're not having to worry. You're just basically taking the element symbol or the compound as it's given to you as a formula and putting it into a skeleton equation. Then you're going to go back through and you're going to insert coefficients where necessary in order to balance the equation. Now, in this particular case, you might see that we have one magnesium on either side of the equation and one sulfur on either side of the equation. So this equation is actually already balanced. Most of them won't be that way, but that does sometimes occur. You should anticipate when you take a test on this unit or a quiz on this unit that you certainly could see an equation that is already balanced. You need to know then to not put in coefficients, or if it makes you feel more comfortable, you can insert ones, right? Because if there's not a coefficient, it means the same thing as one. Okay. So that was a really basic one. <clears throat> we'll move along to our decomposition reaction. So we're going to break a compound apart here. So it says we have potassium chlorate, KClO3. It is heated and yields. Okay, so yields means put an arrow. Because it says heated, remember we need to put a triangle over the arrow. Okay, and what it yields, the products are potassium chloride and oxygen. All right, so now we're going to go through and we are going to balance this. I'm going to start off where I see subscripts. 
Um, another notable thing here. KClO3 is a polyatomic ion. So I've taught you that normally you want to treat those as a group, right? When you're counting up how many elements you have on the reactant side, you would count up that you have one ClO3, one chlorate ion, right? However, this is a good example of a time when you want to treat the chlorine and the oxygen separately. Because if you look over on the product side of the equation, you see that there is not a chlorate ion still existing. There's no ClO3 bonded together. Instead, you have chlorine separate from oxygen. <clears throat> so you can imagine if you were making a reactant product table and tallying up how many ClO3s you had on each side, You'd be good on the reactant side to say you had one, but when you got to the product side, you wouldn't have anything to count. It would be problematic. So we're going to need to make sure to not do that. Okay, We're going to need to make sure to treat the Cl and the O separately. <clears throat> so this might be a case where making a reactant product table is a little bit helpful right off the bat. Usually it's a good thing to use just to check your work at the end, but this is a little more complicated because we have the polyatomic ion breaking up. <clears throat> so on the reactant side, I have one potassium, I have one chlorine, and I have three oxygens. Right? That three only applies to the oxygen. It's not outside of the parentheses. On the product side, I have one potassium, I have one chlorine, and I have two oxygens. So this is my 2-3 rule, right? I've got three oxygens on one side, I've got two oxygens on the other, so I need to get both of them to six. So I'm gonna put a two here, which means two times three gives me six oxygens. And I'm gonna put a three here, which means three times two gives me six oxygens. So that balances my oxygens. But now I have to look back at what else this 2 affected. This 2 affected my potassiums. I now have two potassiums. And the 2 also affected the chlorine. I now have two chlorines, which means I have twice as many potassiums and chlorines on the reactant side as I have on the product side. Fortunately, the potassium and the chlorine are bonded together on the product side, and so by putting a 2 right in front of that whole compound, I now have 2 potassiums and 2 chlorines, and my equation is balanced. <clears throat> All right, moving down to a single replacement reaction. Here I have zinc plus hydrochloric acid and it is yielding zinc chloride and hydrogen. All right, now you could start off by making a reactant product table, but some of you might just go right to the things that have subscripts. <clears throat> you might notice that there are two chlorines here and two hydrogens here. And when you find the hydrogen and the chlorine over on the reactant side, they're bonded together, which means the fact that I have twice as many on the react or excuse me, on the product side as the reactant side makes this an easy problem to fix. I put a 2 here in front of the HCl and now I think I'm set. I'm going to double check with my reactant product table. Sure enough, I've got one zinc two hydrogens, and two chlorines. Here I've got one zinc, two chlorines, and two hydrogens. So I should be good. All right, down to the double replacement reaction. <clears throat> Here I have sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid, yielding sodium sulfate, a couple subscripts there, 
plus water. See how they wrote it H-O-H? That's weird. Normally we write water as H2O, right? Well, it's fine either way. It still means that there's two hydrogens for every one oxygen. But the reason they've done that is because over on the products, excuse me, the reactant side, you've got an OH, a polyatomic ion. And so if you write water as HOH, you can see that that polyatomic ion, that hydroxide, still exists. And then you can count OHs as if they're a single element. And that makes the counting a little easier to keep track of. So when they tell you in the word equation to write water as HOH, you should do it. It'll make your life balancing the equation easier. When they tell you to write it as H2O, you should do it. We've put it that way to try to make your life easier. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to start by looking at something that has a subscript. So I see that the sodium has a subscript of 2 over here. And on the reactant side, it does not. There's only one sodium. So I'm going to put a 2 here. When I do that, it doesn't just affect the sodium, it also affects the hydroxide. I have two hydroxides. So I'm going to put two over here so that I have two hydroxides, but that also affects the hydrogen. Oh boy, now I've got two hydrogens on the product side. So I go over to check out my hydrogen on my reactant side, and as luck would have it, there's already two hydrogens. Which means, I think, if I've done this right, <clears throat> I've balanced my equation. It's a good idea, especially with something that has this many things going on, to create a reactant product table. So I've got 2Na, 2OH, 2H, 1SO4, it's a polyatomic ion. On the product side, I have 2Na, 1SO4. 2H and 2OH. So it looks like I have equal amounts of everything. So <clears throat> this is going to be a good opportunity for you to practice balancing a little bit more. Otherwise, all you're doing is setting up the skeleton equation where before it was provided to you. So we will work on the rest of these problems when you get to class.